Um, so congratulations, everyone. You've made it to the very end of the workshop. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, Rashad for doing such a great job of orchestrating things and making sure we all um, were online and in our chat rooms when we needed to be. I think uh, Jeff um, and our TAs have done a superb job of uh, teaching you about Metaboanalyst. Um, this is certainly the most popular part of the workshop and, and uh, we try and give people a fair bit of time just to sort of play around. And every year there's something new uh, and, and more expansive in Metaboanalyst. So I learn a lot just by sitting back and watching what uh, Jeff and the team have done. Um, today, I'm just going to try and do something quick before all of you fall asleep um, and before you get too hungry. Um, but this is to, to look at about the future of metabolomics. Um, it's a little speculative, um, and so I'm certainly inviting comments or questions. Um, but it's based on um, being involved in metabolomics for a long time, but also being involved with a lot of groups around the world uh, doing some pretty cutting edge work in bio mm -hmm. in, in metabolomics. Um, so most of you are taking this workshop because you're interested in it and most of it because you're realizing that metabolomics is growing in popularity. Uh, when I started in the field of metabolomics back in 1998, uh, it didn't even have a name. Uh, we were choosing all kinds of different things. There was only one or two papers published a year. Uh, as of 2019, there are more than 6,000 papers published in the field and it's growing uh, pretty consistently. The worry is, um, where is metabolomics going? Is it kind of reaching a peak right now? And you know, next year, everyone is gonna leave and find something else. Maybe everyone jumps into the microbiome or someone finds something more in epigenetics. Is it gonna level off? Um, which is sort of the way that most things have happened in things like proteomics um, and some fields of genomics? Um, or is it gonna continue to, to climb? Uh, and how much longer will it climb in terms of popularity and interest? When you look at where it could go, you have to try and identify where there's some central bottlenecks in metabolomics. Um, some of these bottlenecks are things that we've brought up already. Um, one is the fact that metabolomics is pretty labor intensive, uh, whether it's preparing the samples, running the samples, or even doing the data analysis. Uh, another point that we've highlighted is that often we're happy if we just get uh, 50 to 100 metabolites when we know that in fact there are hundreds of thousands. So we have very incomplete coverage and that's been a, a, a real sore point for metabolomics. We know the equipment is very large and expensive. Uh, we've also highlighted the challenges of uh, lacking quantification. In fact, uh, proteomics basically hit the wall um, and declined quite substantially in interest because it never really got around the problem of quantification. Um, we also have a real challenge in translating uh, metabolomics uh, discoveries either into the clinic, into the veterinary classes or approaches into industry, um, into environmental applications. So the translation from the, the, the bench to uh, real life applications is challenging. And then a, a lot of money um, has driven um, you know, our activities in the omics world, uh, largely sponsored by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it was big pharma that pushed uh, genomics. It was big pharma that pushed proteomics. It was big pharma that actually started metabolomics. It's big pharma that's been pushing precision medicine. It's big pharma that pushed um, um, big data for medicine. So if you can make your field matter to big pharma, then it also helps to, to uh, advance the field. So I'm gonna talk about some trends um, and I'll also discuss some aspirational thoughts about these trends in metabolomics. I'm gonna talk about automation. I'm gonna be talking about efforts to expand metabolome coverage. We're gonna be talking about quantification and the importance of that and where people are going. I'm gonna take some examples of how metabolomics can move from the lab to the clinic uh, and how metabolomics is coming back into drug development and discovery and, and becoming more relevant. So automated metabolomics is becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, I've mentioned a couple of these things like Brooker's efforts in NMR to do lipoprotein, juice, and wine, where it's possible to process samples in about five minutes automatically. 
Uh, I'd mentioned the software tool called Konomics. Some of you guys have used it, but it has a semi-automatic method. Um, SciX has introduced a, a lipidizer, which allows you to measure uh, fairly automatically about 1,100 lipids. And Biocrates has been a company uh, in Austria that's been offering kits to do uh, targeted metabolomics, uh, first the P180, then the P400, then the P500. Uh, and there are other companies as well that are starting to offer these automatic or semi-automatic approaches to doing metabolomics. They sort of either open the kit or press the button or load the system and you can do metabolomics while you sleep. There are also a growing number of service providers that also allow you to make metabolomics pretty much automatic too. So you don't have to buy a mass spec. You don't have to be uh, someone who's spending all their time learning the techniques, although it's good to learn them. Um, so there are core facilities. Uh, I've mentioned the Metabolomics Innovation Center, and that's where um, my and Mark currently are working. That's also where uh, Jeff cut his teeth uh, when he was starting off as a uh, graduate student and a postdoc. There are companies like Metabolon. Uh, there's about a, a half dozen uh, metabolomic centers uh, in the US. There's the National Phenome Center, which is a network uh, spreading across in Singapore, uh, Birmingham and London. Um, there's Nightingale, a Finnish company that does uh, metabolomics. It's running through millions of samples in the UK Biobank. Netherlands has a core facility. Um, these are all places around the world that do um, very extensive, very high quality metabolomics uh, measurements. And so you just have to send your samples off to them and a few weeks later, the answers arrive on your doorstep. Of course, it's not free, uh, but these are basically um, operated as an at cost service to, uh, to the public. We've already seen uh, some of the tools. Um, Basil uh, was one that you guys have already used. That's essentially automatic NMR. Uh, metabolomics. You've seen GC AutoFit also trend towards automated GCMS metabolomics. And then as the kits have evolved, the automated LCMS metabolomics. So the idea is if, if you can get um, um, these approaches more automated, uh, whether it's NMR, whether it's GCMS or targeted LCMS, it will make metabolomics uh, much easier for you guys, much more accessible for your colleagues uh, and much more useful. Right now, the real software challenge is trying to automate untargeted metabolomics. And you guys have seen uh, some efforts um, with that that uh, Jeff is working towards through uh, Metaboanalyst R. Uh, but it is really, really challenging uh, given the diversity of preparations, samples and, and analytical methods. Um, but that is an aspirational goal that we would like to see in the future. Um, expanding metabolome coverage, um, this is the Achilles heel to metabolomics. And if it's not solved soon, I think metabolomics will become largely irrelevant. So in terms of untargeted metabolomics, uh, typically only about 2% of the detected MS peaks are actually identified. Most metabolomic studies report fewer than 100 identified metabolites, and yet we know there are hundreds of thousands of, of known metabolites. Most metabolomic studies don't even reach MSI level one. Many fail to even reach level two. And in terms of coverage compared to genomics and proteomics, we're at roughly one to 2% of what uh, is possible with these other technologies. Whether it's clinicians or environmental chemists or toxicologists, they generally lack tool trust in the tools that don't have uh, broad coverage. And metabolomics really as yet does not have broad coverage. Now we talked about the, the different levels of sensitivity of the tools with NMR, GCMS and LCMS. And we know that the less sensitive methods actually tell us more about the metabolome than the more sensitive methods. Uh, that's because in, in things like NMR, GCMS, you're detecting um, high abundance compounds that we know a lot about. Whereas with LCMS, we're detecting very low abundance compounds that we know almost nothing about. Um, it's a challenge. So we'd like to be able to go to more known unknowns in LCMS. And as yet, we haven't been able to figure out how to do that. So what are these known unknowns? 
um, in many cases, we, we have a really good idea about the compounds that are in the environment. We have a good idea about the compounds in our foods, a good idea about the compounds that are in our bodies. But all of those things, whether they're foods or pollutants or even the endogenous compounds, uh, go through something called biotransformation or chemotransformation. So these known compounds get metabolized and they're converted to mostly unknown and uncharacterized compounds. And so this is called the chemical dark matter in metabolomics. And we currently estimate that the number of unknown unknowns in the universe, at least the environment that we live on earth is about 5 million. So that's a huge number. And you've seen this slide before is if we had to try and synthesize all these compounds, even though we don't know what they are, or if we try to plug them through artificial guts or artificial livers or artificial transformations, it would cost billions and billions of dollars. And that's not possible. No government's willing to, to make that kind of investment, certainly not now. Um, so the approach is, I think that we're left with is to see if we can come up with ways of generating those structures computationally and generating their uh, spectra computationally. And that is something that is certainly more feasible. So this has given rise to something called in silico metabolomics. And this is a, an emerging trend that's happening around the world. It's making use of computers and it's making use of what we know. So we've talked about the compounds that are in drug bank or HMDB or others. And those, when you add them all up, they're about 250,000 compounds. If you run them through this tool called Biotransformer, it does the uh, chemical predictions. It, it imagines these things in the liver, it imagines them in, in the gut, um, and, it, and it does essentially chemical prediction. It predicts chemical reactions. And right now the estimate is that roughly each compound can produce around 20 different metabolites. So these are metabolites of metabolites. So that's the assumption, and there's good reason to believe that that actually represents a good portion of the unknown or the dark metabolome. So now what do you do when you've generated all these structures? Well, once you've got those feasible, chemically or biochemically feasible structures, then you want to try and generate their observables because in metabolomics, we actually don't see the structures. We see their spectra. We see their mass spectra, their NMR spectra. We see their retention times. So what we want to do is be able to predict those observables, the spectra, the MS, MS, NMR, GCMS, the collisional cross-section. And we have to do that for literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of compounds. But the result is that we now hopefully would have not only the structures predicted or known, as well as the predicted observables or known. And from there, we can use the, the rules and methods that we talked about before about how you do database matching to figure out what your unknowns are. So it's a, it's a technique in silicon metabolomics. It uses prediction of biologically feasible metabolites. It uses prediction of observables from retention indices, retention times, NMR, collisional cross-section, uh, molecular weights, and MS spectra. The tool I, I mentioned is called Biotransformer. Uh, it was developed by a student of mine, uh, Yannick, um, who's now working in the US um, with um, Dow. Um, and um, it's outlined in terms of what it does. It uses a, a range of techniques or tools um, to take a structure um, run it through a, a bunch of reasoning engines and uh, to determine what would happen in, if it was in phase one metabolism, that's cytochrome P450, phase two metabolism, which is what happens also in the liver, glucuronidation, sulfation. What happens when compounds are in the gut? What happens when compounds are out in the environment? Or what happens when compounds are just floating around and exposed to a variety of enzymes, which are not always perfect in their uh, specificity. Um, so um, it's this database which uses known handmade rules as well as machine learned rules uh, has been created. Uh, it's been tested and it seems to perform quite a bit better than commercial tools. It has very good precision and recall. So it came out last year and it's being used by quite a few people around the world. 
Uh, there's a website. Um, it's not as good as we'd like it to be, but uh, it's pretty quick. It allows you to take uh, a couple of structures at a time and to predict the products and reaction mechanisms. And it's now being run to generate millions of compounds. And we hope to have it finished in a couple months. We've been testing it as well. Someone was taking uh, green tea metabolites, giving them to rats, collecting their urine. And when you do that, you often see many, many unknowns. And so using um, biotransformer, they took uh, these green tea polyphenols and had biotransformer predict um, about 30 or 40 different possible structures. And they were able to identify 22 of them. And they were able to uh, suggest uh, at least 12 novel structures that they're trying to confirm right now. So it allowed them to identify many more compounds than they had even hoped to, to see. Uh, and it, on top of that, it was able to, to essentially generate hypotheses about a lot of the unknowns or unknown unknowns that they couldn't figure out. So the, the utility of in silico metabolomics depends on having not only biologically transformed or biologically feasible structures, you also have to be able to accurately predict those um, properties, uh, mass spectral properties and uh, other chemical properties. So we know that if you've got a structure, you can calculate both the molecular weight and molecular formula. We can calculate approximately retention time. We can calculate GC retention indices quite accurately. Actually, AFI has come up with a very powerful method for doing that. Uh, as we've learned about um, CFMID, we can calculate MS spectra uh, fairly accurately. NMR spectra are also quite accurately calculated. Infrared uh, and collisional cross-sections can also be calculated very accurately. So we talked about CFMID and how it's steadily improving in terms of its performance, um, both using machine learning as well as uh, handmade rules. But there's also great interest in measuring um, uh, ion mobility spectroscopy and calculating collisional cross-sections. Um, and there's a number of instruments now being sold, all the major manufacturers have them, which allow you to predict, uh, or actually you can measure collisional cross-section, but now there are ways to predict them. And what's quite surprising is how accurate the collisional cross-section can be predicted and how it's dependent on different um, uh, adducts and the types of adducts uh, that are produced uh, will lead to different uh, collisional cross-sections. And using things like machine learning or a mix of quantum mechanics and machine learning, uh, the error that people are able to get is down to about 3% or less. And this is in some cases sufficient to distinguish between isomers, it's sufficient to distinguish between um, compounds that we normally can't distinguish. Um, and so collisional cross-section is a very promising route to uh, identify these unknown unknowns and to do sort of standards free metabolomics because if you can predict the mass or you can predict the max spe spectrum or the collisional cross-section, it narrows things down quite a bit. The other thing is that NMR uh, is still one of the most valuable and useful tools for identifying and characterizing novel or unknown compounds. Almost anyone who does natural product work or anyone who's ever done novel compound characterization has always had to return to NMR. Um, there are a number of commercial programs that allow you to predict NMR spectra. Um, they're pretty quick. The uh, problem is that um, none of them are free. And this has always been a problem in Cheminformatics. So um, we've been spending a fair bit of time trying to develop a freeware program that will allow you to accurately predict uh, the spectra and the chemical shifts for any compound in any solvent, proton, carbon, 1D, 2D and also predict not only the chemical shifts, but all the couplings and the prochiral ones. We've tested this against some of the best um, commercial ones and the program itself does about 20% better than the, the best commercial ones. Uh, and it does almost as well as the very, very accurate quantum mechanical ones, which take hours and hours. But this one is very fast, just a few seconds. So there's a clear trend and I think exciting uh, possibilities where um, advances in machine learning and deep learning, improvements in machine precision uh, and how we can measure things uh, are allowing us to accurately predict a whole range of spectral parameters, which opens the door 
to this idea of in silico metabolomics. And it's not just a pipe dream. There's a couple of papers that appeared a few years ago, uh, one by uh, Lloyd Sumner on the right, um, where they predicted a whole bunch of uh, metabolites, uh, biologically feasible ones, or another paper published by a group in Switzerland doing natural product chemistry, where they used um, CFMID uh, to predict a whole range of spectra uh, and use those to identify a large number of previously unknown compounds. So it works. Uh, it's worked in our hands, it's worked in other hands. So this concept of in silico or reference-free metabolomics is, is feasible. Certainly if we can make uh, mass spectral prediction and clinical cross-section into more spectra even a little more accurate, this would be, uh, be a huge win. And whether it's predicting the metabolites uh, more accurately um, would also be a huge win. And I think there's still uh, efforts uh, abroad and also in our labs and other labs to prove that in silico reference from metabolomics can work consistently. If it does, then the limitations that have been holding us back in terms of metabolite comprehensiveness, um, I think will be cleared somewhat quickly. Quantification is something that I've been harping out for a while, um, and it is a trend as well. Uh, I know many of you are doing or working with um, untargeted metabolomics, and that's certainly been a theme uh, for today. Um, but it is an issue that's been brought up over and over again. So even now, 90% of papers in metabolomics are uh, untargeted, uh, semi-quantitative. Less than 10% actually use absolute quantification. But if that trend continues, uh, metabolomics is going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and so will many of you in terms of your career paths. Because in order to translate your findings into something useful, you have to have quantitation. And this is the thing that killed proteomics. Uh, proteomics never got to be quantitative. And as a result, most proteomics labs have now merged or evolved to become metabolomics labs. Um, because no one was able to convert proteomics applications. So there are a number of not only automated, but also quantitative um, platforms that are available. I've mentioned the Brooker one, I've mentioned Biocrates, I've mentioned Kenomics. These are commercial organizations that sell or produce or support fully quantitative metabolomics. Now, Historically, targeted or quantitative metabolomics was, was not as exciting or as impressive as in untargeted. So in the, even just until a couple of years ago, people were generally happy to get 50 to up to maybe 150 metabolites identified through targeted methods. Whereas with untargeted methods, with a fair bit of effort, people could get up to like 300 or 400. But over the last two years, um, companies like Biocrates have released other kits. So they now have the P500 kit, which measures up to 630 metabolites. That is consistently more than what most people can measure using untargeted metabolomics. Uh, Metabolon has also evolved its platform and they can routinely measure more than 600 metabolites, uh, identify them. Uh, they can uh, at least uh, annotate, not positively identify, about 1,100 metabolites, and their quantitation is pretty good. So quantifiable methods with metabolon, commercial methods like Biocrates, those are actually, in most cases, beating the best that untargeted metabolomics groups can do. Likewise, if you go to lipid approaches, uh, Cyax lipidizer, and then there's other uh, handmade approaches developed in Australia where people are routinely identifying up to 2,000 lipid species and semi quantifying them quite accurately. We've talked about some of the quantitative tools that are available for automatic um, NMR and for GCMS. These don't give you the high numbers that LCMS do, but they certainly make it fast. Um, and quite reliable. So in terms of quantitative targeted metabolomics, on average, it's 10 to 100 times faster than untargeted metabolomics. So you guys should consider that when you're thinking about your experimental design. Um, typically now with the latest techniques, coverage in quantitative metabolomics is either reaching or exceeding routinely what's possible with untargeted metabolomics. 
So that's an important transition uh, that I think you need to consider. There are also some new methods that are being developed that allow you to do quantitation without isotopic standards, looking at ionization efficiency using machine learning techniques. And these were pioneered by a group in Estonia, and they've been shown to work in a wide range of, of, of applications. The other thing to remember is that if you're trying to merge metabolomics data from different platforms, say NMR, GCMS, um, IR, UV, uh, or if you're trying to get it from different labs, the only way you can merge your data is if you have quantitative data. It will never happen if you use untargeted metabolomics data. It's just impossible. So these are things to remember when you're thinking about um, what sort of experiments you should be performing. And this is being realized by many more senior labs and core labs around the world that are doing metabolomics. So right now, routine quantification by targeted metabolomics of 100, 150 metabolites is, is, is there. Um, up to five and 600 through commercial labs or through work that many labs are working on internally is now possible. Um, through uh, commercial groups like Metabolon, it's possible to get up to a thousand for specialized lipidomics. It's well, very easy to get over a thousand metabolites. If we were to use ionization efficiency and machine learning and other predictive techniques that we've talked about, could we get up to 5,000 metabolites? I think we can. And, and this, as I say, would largely be a form of targeted quantitative metabolomics. So those are some key bottlenecks, um, making metabolomics cheaper, faster, better, more comprehensive. But how do you make metabolomics relevant? And I think there's a couple areas where metabolomics needs to, to go. And if you can make it more quantifiable, if you can make it more automatic, if you can make it cheaper and better, then it can move from the lab into the clinic. You guys learned a fair bit today about biomarkers and rock curves and the statistics and methods that uh, a metabolanalyst uses. Um, over the last 50 years, there've been more than 750,000 biomarker papers published in PubMed. That's a pretty substantial portion of, of all of the publications. But of those nearly a million biomarker papers, less than 250 have actually been approved for clinical use. So that's a terrible batting average. Right now, even though proteomics is celebrating its 35th anniversary, there isn't a single biomarker for proteomics that's been approved. And when you think about gene chips and transcriptomics, there's only been five biomarker tests that have been approved. And the reason why transcriptomics and proteomics are doing so bad is because they don't do quantitation. The other thing that many of you probably don't know is that almost all of you have had a metabolomics test. Um, probably only a few of you have had a genetics test. But all of you, uh, if you're under the age of 25 or 30, have had a, a newborn screening test. When you were born within the first few hours, uh, they took a blood spot, they did a heel prick, and they collected blood, and they sent it into a mass spectrometer, and they looked to see if your blood had any unusual metabolites. So there are now literally millions of people around the world who have had metabolomics tests. It's just, you don't remember it because you were a baby. Your parents don't know it because it's done without their consent. Um, and no one calls a newborn screening metabolomics, but it is. So if you think about what the status is in terms of metabolite or chemical testing, um, it's pretty widespread. The number of approved clinical chemistry tests or metabolomics tests uh, in, in this case, Western Canada is over 300. Uh, the number of approved genetics tests uh, in Western Canada is about 130. The number of approved clinical protein tests is a little over 100. And then I mentioned the statistics about transcriptomics and proteomics tests. So in fact, metabolomics already is in the clinic and it's doing better than other omics uh, techniques. Why is it so popular? And even though we don't even know that it's popular, it's because uh, metabolites are great at measuring phenotypes. Um, these are some studies that we've been working on the last few years. We've looked at how you can use metabolites to predict diseases. So this is taking someone who's apparently healthy, taking their blood or urine and saying, well, in a few months to a few years, you're gonna develop this disease. 
So it turns out it's very accurate for predicting preeclampsia. This is high blood pressure that pregnant women develop. So at the first trimester, when they're very healthy, seemingly normal, if you take a blood sample from the mother, you can predict which mothers are gonna develop preeclampsia or not. This opens the possibility of having prophylactic treatment. You can also detect in pregnant mothers whether the infant or fetus has a congenital heart defect, uh, again, in the first trimester. Trisomy 18 or trisomy 21, again, in the first trimester. So not only can you use metabolomics to predict what's gonna happen with a fetus in a mother, you can also use it to predict what's gonna to happen to someone who's been newly diagnosed with cancer. Now, most people don't necessarily buy, die of, of the cancer itself. They die from the effects of cancer, and namely that's cachexia or muscle wasting. And if you know of someone who's had cancer or died from cancer, this is, this is the prime uh, killer. It's, it's the wasting that develops. And so if you can predict which people are gonna be susceptible to cachexia, then you can start making interventions, particularly in nutrition. And it turns out just by measuring a person's urine, you can predict who is gonna be susceptible to cachexia or not. Now, predicting diseases is one thing, uh, diagnosing diseases is another. And so we've been using metabolomics, looking at blood and urine uh, to diagnose uh, transplant rejection. So you can, instead of taking a kidney biopsy, which is used with a giant needle where they stick it on your back and pull out tissue from your kidney, which hurts a lot, uh, you can just take a urine sample and probably more accurately predict if your kidney is being rejected or not. You can distinguish between certain types of heart failure, some which are very lethal and others which are not, just using a quick blood test. Normally that process takes two weeks uh, with using a whole array of, of methods of uh, testing cardiac function. Chronic fatigue syndrome can also be distinguished fairly easily with serum metabolomics. EOE, we talked about some examples of that in your um, analysis um, packages yesterday with uh, GC Autofit and the NMR. You can also use it to identify polyps. And so here you can look in urine to figure out what's going on in the colon. And these metabolites reflect the microbial perturbations that happen in the gut when polyps start developing. So in fact, um, a number of companies have started taking uh, metabolomic markers and translating them into tests. Um, Metabolon has been working on this. Uh, Stemina has been working on an autism test. And a company in Edmonton has converted those polyp tests uh, that I talked about uh, into a test that's now used widely in the US. So metabolomics is being translated to the clinic. Markers are being discovered. And many of these markers have per impressive performance, sometimes significantly better than uh, gene or protein tests. So I think if we can get the message across and if you as aspiring metabolomic scientists can, can make can continue to make interesting discoveries, I think there's a good opportunity for labs to adopt quantitative metabolomics for clinical translation. I think um, better algorithms are being developed using machine learning techniques and some of the methods that, that uh, Jeff mentioned today that allow you to pick out and pull out more powerful uh, markers. Obviously to make something work in the clinic, you want a small number of markers, not tens or a dozen. Uh, you want two or three because that makes the test easy and cheap to perform. And as I said, a number of them are starting to make their way into laboratory developed tests, uh, FDA approved tests, or European Medical Agency approved tests. And so I think this is an exciting time and, and it really has to be driven by uh, scientists wanting to see their work translated. The last thing before you guys all fall asleep um, is to talk about moving metabolomics into a uh, drug discovery game. So metabolomics began as a drug discovery tool. Uh, it started in the um, late 1990s uh, with groups pushing a number of, of large pharma companies to use metabolomics to assess um, how um, drugs uh, are affecting animals in animal studies. Now in drug development, it takes about 10 to 15 years to develop a drug. So everyone's hoping for a COVID-19 drug. Uh, unless someone finds a drug that's already being used, they are not going to develop a new drug for COVID for another 10 years. And it's gonna cost at least a billion dollars for the company that does it. Now it turns out that metabolomics is really useful in drug development. 
It can be used to discover drugs. It can be used to assess the safety of drugs. It can be used to assess the response uh, of drugs uh, or the response of individuals to drugs. It can be used to assess uh, drug testing uh, in phase two and phase three. And it can also be used to follow up um, patients after the drug has been approved. And it turns out that the fact that metabolomics can be used at the entire length of the drug development pipeline where other omics techniques are usually just focused on the discovery side has made metabolomics um, useful once again for drug developers. And this is just highlighting the, the different phases where um, metabolomics is, is being used. Um, it's being used to discover drugs, it's being to help with toxicity screening, it's to develop preclinical efficacy biomarkers, it's done to do toxicity assessments in patients, it's done to do clinical safety biomarkers and clinical safe efficacy biomarkers all the way through. So no other omics technology, in fact, no other technology can find it utility at every, every step of the pipeline. Now, traditionally, the way we do drug discovery is we have used genetics. Uh, we've used things like GWAS techniques to identify uh, marker genes. Many GWAS studies cost millions of dollars and take uh, several years to perform. Of those potential genes that seem promising, on average, about half of them uh, can be targetable. And then of those genes that people find are useful targets, only about half of them uh, can be developed into useful assays uh, involving proteins. And then when people start doing uh, high throughput screening to see if they can find a drug, typically only about 20% of those screening assays lead to a lead compound. So roughly you've got this 20% success, 50%, 50%, 20% success just to get to your lead compound. And then things get really tough. Once you've got your lead compound, you have about a one in 500 chance of getting the lead compound through all the different phases of trials. Um, and even if you can get the lead compound to complete phase three, even when it's marketed, most drugs only succeed about 50% of the time. Some of them have side effects they didn't anticipate. Some of the efficacy isn't as great as they thought. And usually someone comes up with a better drug, which makes your drug kind of useless. So when you look at the total time, 20 years, the total cost, more than a billion dollars, and the total success rate, 0.001%, if you multiply all those ratios together, it's no wonder that most drug companies have stopped doing drug development. On the other hand, if you use metabolite-based drug discovery, you have a much better chance. So rather than doing GWAS study, if you do a metabolomic study to see which metabolites have changed, gone up or down, then in fact, right away, as you guys are learning today, you can zero in on some pathways. Um, and you can do that pretty quickly. With metabolanist, it's not even days, it's more like hours. So once you've zeroed in on the metabolic pathways and therefore some of the critical proteins and genes, then you can start going to databases like Drug Bank, which lists all of the uh, known drugs that target certain proteins and many other kinds of databases like Brenda, which allows you to start choosing some potential inhibitors of enzymes or metabolic, uh, metabolic proteins. In many cases, it turns out those effective inhibitors probably already exist or have already been discovered. And some of them are actually food-based. Some of them are nutrient-based. Some of them are already existing as approved drugs. And so again, using those techniques, because we know so much about metabolism and we know so much about how small molecules target um, various enzymes, transporters, and proteins, uh, it's possible sometimes to get a lead compound quite quickly. And what's more is once you've got your lead compound, uh, if it's already an approved drug or an already an approved metabolite, um, you can go straight to trials. You don't have to go through the FDA uh, because it's technically an approved compound. Um, and what's more, you can use metabolomics to monitor the drug or, and its performance uh, throughout the, the trials and the tests. Now, this might seem pretty fancy, fanciful in the sense of, yes, could you do this for less than a million dollars? And can you do this in a matter of days or weeks or maybe months? Um, well, in fact, it's actually happened. And this was one example, which was a discovery made in 2010, roughly, about 2-hydroxyglutarate. So it was a metabolomic study 
They were looking at people who had or developed uh, brain cancers, and they found that there is a specific um, metabolite, uh, 2-hydroxyglutarate, that was elevated in people who had brain tumors. And it was also associated with certain people with uh, an inborn error of metabolism who also developed uh, high levels of cancer. But 2-HG is very abundant in many brain tumors. And it turns out that they were able to very quickly figure out what was the enzyme that was causing that. And it was a mutant uh, isocitrate dehydrogenase that leads to the production of this oncometabolite. So within a few years, literally, after they figured this out, um, they went through, uh, they did the screens, they found a, a drug in 2014 uh, thanks to the metabolomics efforts. And then it was approved in early 2017. Um, they were able to use analogs that had been discovered in the 1970s uh, for studying TCA metabolism to model this particular drug and develop it. So they're able to use that, that large body of history or historical work and known enzyme inhibitors to develop a drug that is already in the market. And in fact, several other IDH inhibitors have already appeared. So this is an example of how you can have very accelerated drug discovery where you use metabolomics to, to identify the target and use the huge body of metabolism and enzyme inhibition studies that have been published over the last few decades to develop leak compounds very quickly. So in terms of the future metabolomics, I think um, there's several areas that, that I, I think are exciting, areas where a lot of people are working towards where I think as a group and as new, newly trained metabolomics people that you should try and focus on. And as I say, these are in the areas of automated metabolomics, expanding metabolome coverage, improving the ability to quantify in metabolomics, translating metabolomics, not just to the clinic, but to other areas from environmental, um, to monitoring, to um, animal and, and, and um, um, uh, water quality uh, assessments, and then trying to get metabolomics uh, engaged in drug discovery, because I think uh, there are clear examples where it's leading to completely novel targets, completely novel drugs, and allowing drug development to become much, much more rapid than before. <laughs>